what was important for me was to try and show people the opportunities that exist for them as a result of the stuff we're doing in space. Whether it's a career choice for them, whether it's technology that we've developed that exists for them, or maybe even more importantly, something we learned in flying in space or preparing to fly in space that might be useful for someone else to learn. How do you deal with things? How do you prepare for things? How do you not be afraid of stuff that are inherently terrifying, like a rocket launch? So for 20 years, I've been talking about those things and trying to find a way to explain them to people. And it just made sense with my third space flight and deepened experience of living and commanding the International Space Station to try to write them down and tell the stories, because that's always the way for people to get a framework and to be interested in what's happening. But then use the story to also illustrate how I got there, or how I made that happen, or why it was successful when it should have failed, and see if there's anything useful. Because when you bring it right back, what really matters is how does this affect everybody on Earth? That's the real point of it. And that's why I chose the title, Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth. That's what really matters. Life in space is nice, but how does it matter to us on Earth? And the book is very much a compilation of, of all that. I'm really delighted that uh, you know it's one of the top 20 books selling in the U.S. right now, uh, and the top book selling in Canada. So, so I'm pleased that other people found that it was useful and interesting. We actually we obviously have a million questions for you, and our, our readers do too. We couldn't take live uh, questions today, but we did ask uh, what they want to know, and, and one of them actually got my first question. Cyril uh, on on Twitter uh, wants to know just what what did you find on this last slide uh, was, was personally the, the biggest challenge to either get through or to, or to accomplish. Uh, During the flight itself, there was one day, you said Cyril? Is that Cyril. Right? Yeah. Cyril asked a question. There was one day the Russians were going out on a spacewalk, and my job was to sort of finish up their suit up and then close up all the hatches and run all the valves to safely isolate them from the space station so they could go outside. You don't want to mess that up, right? And, and people have messed it up in the past, knock up the seals clean. So that was my job for the day. And just as I was getting ready to go do that, the main toilet in the American segment failed. And there was no one else to help because it was a spacewalk and day. People were trapped behind hatches and things or on the other side of the hatches. So it was totally my job, unplanned. But I had then suddenly to not only get these guys ready to go outside, but I had to take the entire toilet apart. It was the main pump separator in the middle that I had to replace. So complete. If you could do brain surgery on a toilet, it was complete brain surgery on the toilet. Uh, going and getting parts taken off, and then rushing out of the American segment and working in Russian to get the guys outside, and then back into the toilet when I had five minutes. And after about three hours, finally, I had the hatches closed. The guys were safely outside. I went back to the toilet. I flipped the switch, and it went. It spun up, and I had a completely successful day. And it sounds trivial. But it was such a combination of skills, of speaking Russian, of understanding all the mechanisms in the Russian segment, of understanding this fairly complex system that, that is our, uh, our waste removal system on the station, and having nobody to help me, and being able to execute all of it and have both of them work. It was a little kind of a personal day, but it, I really was uh, as challenged and as proud of that day as any other that I had in space. A lot of your book is devoted um, to some of the counterintuitive lessons you learned during your career. And one of those is to aim to be a zero. Can you explain? Aim to be a zero. It, it sounds undesirable, right? But of course everyone wants to aim to be a positive or a plus one. So, but I've seen so many times, uh, even in my own behavior, where you come into a new situation and you look around briefly and you immediately think, OK, I've got this place sorted out. and I'm whatever God's gift to this situation, so I'm going to start taking action and make things go. And so many times when you've set up thinking you're about to be a plus one in a situation, you don't know what you're doing. You're a minus one. And everybody around you is going, what are you, what are you doing? Don't do that. You don't even know what you're doing. And it happens all the time. And so a long time ago, I looked at, let's come into new situations with my aim target of being a zero. I, I could probably help if I give myself enough time. But let's come in and, and be uh, not a minus one at the get-go. Don't come in and, and make a hash of things. Just come in, try and be supportive, try and be learning and listening more than anything else. And then as things develop, as you truly get an understanding of the subtleties around you, then start trying to make 
uh, improvement so that you can trend towards a plus one. Because almost invariably, if you come in like a bull in a china shop into a new situation, unless you're really lucky, you think you're going to be a plus one, and everybody around you knows that you're a minus one. And I, I consciously run that in my head when I'm coming into a new situation. And uh, almost always, it serves me well. Just think, well, OK, aim for zero for now. Later on, we'll worry about being a plus one. If the building's on fire, then that's a little different. We need to do stuff right now. But buildings are hardly ever on fire. It's almost always a personal misperception when you're trying to be a plus one and you end up being a negative. And it's better to give yourself the time by just aiming for zero. Yeah, um, you know, just thinking about what you said before about the experience that you had in Mormon. Just sharing that. We were, we were very, like, just enthralled by the, the many videos that you record, uh, recorded. YouTube and just getting them out there. And I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, brushing your teeth, uh, wringing out a towel, yeah. uh, playing guitar. Um, you know, it just seemed that there was so much more that we'd ever seen before. And I'm just wondering, you know, how that, why that had ever happened before? Why do you think that this is kind of like a, a crystallization of that whole experience sharing process? Part of it is because of technology. We had the capability on board with real time downlink of video. It's a, it's a lot of bandwidth, but we uh, have that now on the space station that I can take a video, and it still takes several hours to downlink the video, but we have those several hours overnight, and I could load it up in the hopper and call down to Houston and say, hey, I've got a video to send down that I made about whatever, how I wash my hair, and they would send it down to the ground, and then the people at the Canadian Space Agency would take it, edit it down into a couple minutes, and be able to release it within a day or two couldn't do that on my previous space flights. We just didn't have the technology to do it. The other side was just personal motivation. Uh, I know from my experience talking uh, in schools and everywhere around the world that people are interested in people. They're interested in the minutia of how you actually do these things. What is it like? What is it like to, whatever, how do you take a bath? How do you, what's it like when you look up the window? How do you trim your mustache? What do you do up there? Just, they want to see the differences. And I thought the most elegant example of that was two students, we had a national contest in Canada, a science contest. And I was expecting some pretty esoteric contests. But two young ladies on the East Coast said, what if you just wring out a towel? What will that look like? And I thought about it, but that's going to be a nice little thought experiment, a little visual experiment. It's running behind you right now, in fact. And I knew what it was going to look like. But I just brought the towel right up close to the camera and started twisting. And it's so non-intuitive. And therefore, it's so instructional as to what happens because the water uh, behaves so differently than everyone's experiences are. It, it runs up my hands. And it looks like a bunch of jelly and stuff. It's just so everybody, and millions and millions and millions of people looked at it. And it was that type of motivation of, of showing people what it's really like because when you see in a new frontier what it's really like, it, it makes you think an original thought. That is a real benefit and the, and the, the aim of me putting all those videos together. Uh, I was just delighted with the huge level of response that came as a result. You mentioned also just the, the, the role of the folks on the ground. And um, you mentioned the CSA specifically. I'm wondering if being a Canadian astronaut gave you a little bit more freedom than, say, uh, you know, a NASA astronaut or a Russian cosmonaut might have. Like everything, there's a plus and a minus, right? Or an advantage and a disadvantage. Canadians fly very seldom in space. Most of my classmates out of the NASA astronaut group that I was part of flew many, many more times than I did. And that makes sense. Canada is just a small contributing partner to the space station. So after I've been an astronaut for 20 years, I've been in space for 20 days total. So that's not a big return on my investment. Um, so that's kind of a disadvantage. The advantage of that time is, though, it gave me all that time to train and get skills. I, I basically was our highest level of qualification in everything. So it really put me in a good position to command the spaceship, to be the space station commander. Um, and then, as a Canadian on board, I did have, I think, a little more latitude, just because, yes, I'm a NASA astronaut, but NASA doesn't pay my wages. I really work for the Canadian Space Agency, and they could negotiate with NASA on my behalf when I, say, wanted to uh, to do a bunch of extra downlink or on my own time record music or something, uh, it, it, you know, it ended up having some extra people in my corner um, who I pushed right to their limit as well because I figured I'm up here, I'm just going to keep pumping out product and hopefully 
they'll be able to turn it into something that people can see. And between NASA and the CSA, they were terrific about it, and the results were, were huge. And not only did they see a lot of what we did, but it affected how many people actually go to the NASA science sites. You could, you could track directly the big change in the number of people following the science that goes on space station, just like inviting people on board with human interest. One of the things that I learned from your book that I hadn't heard before was that NASA actually holds death sims with yeah. the astronauts in training where you... We call them contingencies. Okay. So death sims <laughs> just doesn't sound very good. Right. But you actually play out what might happen if you die in space from um, improvising a body bag at the space station to right. holding a mock press conference with your spouses there. So right. it sounds very grim, but can you tell us how that helped you prepare for your space? Well, things happen, of course, in orbit, and you can just... And this applies to everybody, not just NASA, but uh, if you just say, well, something scary might happen, let's just not deal with it and hope it never happens. You, that's how a lot of people go through life, right? And that's how a lot of organizations go through life. They know that bad things might happen, but they just, like an ostrich, right? They just kind of like, I'm not going to like let that affect my thinking for now. And you're okay if you get away with it. But as soon as something bad happens, you're kind of helpless or you're paralyzed with pain. Or, or you don't know what you're supposed to do, or some combination of all three of those things. So NASA, long, long ago, well before their, their first space flight, realized we can't get into that boat. We, it's too hard. It's too complex. It's too dangerous. And the way they get around it is through accurate preparation and simulation. And what that means is you get everybody that's actually going to be there on the real day, and then you give them a situation that is as realistic as possible, and you make everyone play out their part as if it was really happening, right to the end. You actually have a separate group of people whose whole job it is is to put in malfunctions, the training team. Their whole job is to exquisitely torture everybody so that, so that it teases out new information. We never thought of what happens if this computer and this hydraulic system and this windshield crack all happen at the same time. And then we develop a new result, and then the final part is, you have to track your results and make them part of your institution, and we call those flight rules. And you build a huge book of rules of how to respond to any of these different situations. And by going through that process, you think it would make you feel sort of grim. All you ever deal with are emergencies and disasters and deaths and things. But in truth, it's actually really common. Because now, instead of everybody just going, boy, I hope that never happens. And if it does, everyone just run around and scream. Instead, you go, well, I hope that never happens, but if it does, we all know what we're doing. Next. What's the next thing? Come on. Give me that. Give me the next thing. Like Rocky Balboa. Sure, you hit me on the job, but I'm okay. Do it again. And as a result, it's very comforting, and you become much more confident by like visualizing disaster than you would have been by just visualizing success. Well, on, on, a, on a lighter note. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of our readers, Nancy uh, Duran of Massachusetts, uh, had a great question. She was wondering um, what of the experiences uh, that you had in space uh, and your unique perspective, uh, you know, being off the planet, uh, if, if there was anything that, that fundamentally altered like, either your priorities or, or your personality or even your politics, uh, was there a moment like that? You know, it's for Nancy who asked this question, but. I think for the first astronauts, the answer would be absolutely yes. They were kind of plucked out of being a test pilot. They were very rapidly trained and, and then put on world-renowned missions. I mean, where you were at this toiling away test pilot, and then you get hired as an astronaut. Two years later, you were doing your first spacewalk, and three and a half years later, you're walking on the boat, and you could cover up the world with your thumb. And those guys weren't psychologically prepared for that experience, nor were they prepared for what the world was going to treat them like when they got home. Suddenly, they're, you know, they're the ultimate rock star hero with a ticker tape parade for the rest of their life. And that really changed some of those guys, their perspective, their politics, their, their fundamental beliefs. And some of them even their drinking habits. I mean, it was just tough. But we are much better prepared now. We asked all those guys, hey, what do we do right, what do we do wrong? We built a whole psychological support group. We, you know, I helped make IMAX movies so that other astronauts could see those and go, oh, that's what it's going to be like. And as a result, the, the changes are much more gradual and, 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 and 
expected. And so I think it does have a change in you for Nancy here in that it deepens it deepens you a little bit. It makes you more a little resolved. Um, and I think for every one of us, it kind of reaffirms whatever our set of beliefs were to get there. But very few of us, I think, would come back and go, well, I had no idea what it was going to be like, and therefore it, it changed me completely. It's, it's just, it's not that way. And I think it's better this way, in fact, because we could stay productive longer and, uh, and we could have a better chance of reintegrating when we get back. Were you prepared for the celebrity status that greeted you when you came back? It seems like kind of kind of beyond. Uh, people forget I flew in space twice before this flight. Uh, you know, I'm on postage stamps in Canada. I'm on the on a coin in Canada. I have schools named after me, roads named after me. Uh, I, the, you know, for the last 20 years, I've had all sorts of fan mail. I'm recognized everywhere I go. So it's not something new. This last flight was just a, an extension of that. And now, you know, with uh, the videos and things that I did. Became more so and more worldwide. And hundreds of millions of people have seen that David Bowie video, which of course then that means hundreds of millions of people are recognizing me that I wouldn't have before. But really, it's not like I, I was uh, blundering around in the dark and suddenly I'm on stage. Not like that at all. It's just kind of an extension of it. No one would have predicted the level to which it is now. That's kind of crazy. But no one thinks it's bad either. That many people see how cool the opportunity to leave Earth and live in space actually is. And it's not just robots doing experiments, it's people living in a new place. And it's an extension of ourselves and what we think about it and what we can do. To me, that's that's the key part. I'm really happy with a huge reflected interest in it. Well, you mentioned David Bowie. I wanted to make sure, I'm sure you've gotten this question so many times, we're just wondering where that video came from. Ah. What did Dave Bowie think? <laughs> um, and, uh, and you know, you mentioned that your son has been involved in, in a lot of these things. You could touch, touch on, on that part, too. Sure. Uh, you had to decide how much social media to do during the flight. And I knew I was going to uh, tweet some. And I had to deal with Evan before I saying, hey, I'm going to try and send some Twitter and help me out if you can. Well, we didn't have any master. We just sort of had it laid out. But as soon as we saw that I could tweet from space, and then Evan decided, hey, you know, I can really spread this through the rest of social media, through Reddit and, and Tumblr and all over the place. Uh, and then immediately, people from all over the world started asking for, hey, you got to play Space Oddity. I think it's cool, as soon as I heard I was a musician. And I kind of resisted, but I said, Evan, rewrite the words so that the astronaut lives at the end. And Evan rewrote the words. I recorded the audio. They sounded good. I got some friends to put some music underneath. Came up with a really good audio version. And then Evan said, audio's good, but you're in space. It has to be video. So we got permission from Bowie, which took some work. Um, and then I just, one Saturday, I photographed filming myself singing the song and uh, sent all that video down to the Canadian Space Agency. They organized it and approved it. And then Evan and, and a buddy uh, edited it into that video. And it just went crazy as a result. And I, I know that 18 or 19 million people have seen it. Just that YouTube clip directly. But when you look at all the rebroadcasts around the world, it's hundreds of millions of people. It just just makes me laugh, you know, because it's just a little thing I did on a Saturday afternoon. But Evan saw very clearly, and I eventually saw also, the, uh, the impact of us doing something very human in a new place. It was really revealing to a lot of people, instructive to a lot of people, of what this space station actually means. It's, it's a different extension of our perception of ourselves. And it's a stage that we didn't even recognize we built. And it just shows a whole bunch of potential and inspiration for a lot of artists and musicians and, and inventors all around the world. So Evan was right. And, uh, and I'm really pleased that they voted me into it. Well, I, I know that we were floored by it. I still can't stop watching it. Um, well, that's about all the, the time we had today. Chris, thanks so much for, for coming in to talk about the the, the book in uh, uh, for space.com. I'm Tarek Malik. Uh, and I'm Chris Hatfield. Thanks very much for inviting me today. It's a pleasure to talk with you both and with everybody online. You. And we're clear, folks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Nice, nice timing on the watch plot thing.